you again, Dave. Good to see you as well. And wonderful having all of these people here to listen to our conversation about the future of healthcare. Good to be physically present with so many folks. Yeah, huh? good to be in person. Yeah, That's it feels refreshing. good. Um, you know, I was struck by a comment that uh, Merck's Ken Frazier said last night when he was on stage. He said, the healthcare changes we make over the next two to five years will impact healthcare for the next 50 years, 50 years. So we're at a critical time, obviously, but it's also such an exciting time uh, to be a company in the healthcare space with so much innovation going on. Looking to the future, what do you see as the big macro changes going forward? Yeah, we see at least three major forces transforming healthcare um, over the next, say, decade horizon. First and foremost, we call it pharmacological innovation. We think the vast majority of healthcare innovation will take place pharmacologically, whether you think about specialty pharmaceuticals, gene therapies, personalized medicines, the target and precision that's able to be brought to bear for both treatment and curative events will be transformative from a societal standpoint. The second is what we talk about are alternative sites of care. How do you embrace technology and healthcare professionals to bring services closer in a more personalized and intimate way to an individual, well beyond what we know as telemedicine today, including using technology, but also re-envisioning what could happen in the home in support of an individual. And then third, we talk about it through the lens of whole person health. How do you finally take the mind and body connection and bring them together um, in terms of dealing with overall health, well-being, and vitality? We think those three large transformative forces are well at work today. And in many ways, COVID has supercharged a lot of the activity around those three transformative forces. Well, let's talk a little bit more about each of them. So you're talking about innovation in uh, pharma. We certainly saw during the pandemic um, the innovation and the speed to come up with vaccines. But beyond that, we're hearing about so many uh, new treatments for uh, disease, terrible uh, diseases. Um, you know, it's great uh, to hear that Biogen has an Alzheimer's drug, but you know, there's always the cost factor. They're expensive. I mean, how do you afford this? So um, how does Cigna deal with this innovation in pharma, but the cost factor? Sure. So when you deliver value, you have to get the right balance of affordability and quality. Now, when we come into pharmaceuticals, we have a, a, another wave that's transpiring on the horizon for the United States, where the U.S. currently lags the world relative to leveraging biosimilars. If we look at other OECD countries, if the US was utilizing biosimilar medications at the rate of other OECD countries, it'd be about $300 billion of savings, which would be able to fund additional innovation from that standpoint. So one is identify the opportunities to improve overall affordability, because as we get into the new innovations, they will be expensive, they'll be more precise. So the key there is gonna be making sure that we work with information and the practicing physician to get the right medicine to the right person through the right side of care, to collaborating with the healthcare manufacturers mm -hmm. to make sure that the reward structure is based on the clinical outcome, not just the consumption. And third, and very importantly, that requires clinical programs to be wrapped around an individual to be able to yield the right outcomes. So getting more value, biosimilars is a great example where Cigna through Evernorth is well positioned to support the convergence of biosimilars over the next several years. That will take costs out of the system while we continue to improve quality, and then more precision around the use of specialty medications targeted to individuals, coordinating care around the individuals, and then partnering with the manufacturers to pay based on clinical outcomes, not just consumption. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, talk to us a little bit more about other ways that Cigna can enable in innovation because, you know, uh, payers we saw during the pandemic have so much power. I mean, this isn't a, a pharma case, but you look at telehealth and telemedicine. That had been around for 20 years and nobody was really using telemedicine. But as soon as the payer said, okay, um, we're gonna reimburse a virtual visit the same way we do an in-person visit, things exploded. So what are ways when it comes to pharma that you can enable that kind of innovation? Sure, so when you think about you referencing payers, so the market's changing quite rapidly that 
more of the organizations you talk to as payers become broad diversified service companies. So we're a diverse health service company with pharmacy services, care management and care delivery services, benefit services, intelligence services. If you take that back to pharma where you're referencing, it's precision medicine that's, mm -hmm. that's important, right? right? About half of medicine in the United States is evidence-based care. So how do you get the right pharmaceutical to the right individual at the right time and ensure medication compliance staying on the medication, and then coordinating the services around that. There's a lot of clinical resources, both medical, pharmaceutical, and behavioral that are quite important there to get the right clinical quality for an individual, value, sustained affordability. That's an example of basic innovation that transpires. And then as we move forward, as I noted, in the specialty pharmaceuticals, the precision there is mission critical. So it's not a matter of specialty pharmaceuticals. It's not even a matter of oncology specialization. Right. It's a matter of 15 subspecializations in oncology by tumor type, where you have a level of precision back to the manufacturer of targeted medications and the clinician. So if there's a word here, it's precision. Mm -hmm. And then it's supported by the right clinical resources, be they medical, pharmaceutical, or behavioral, and then it's augmenting it with technology. Let's talk a little bit about the other trend you spoke about. You said alternative sites of care, and we just heard from the CEO of Mayo Clinic and also from Walmart, where they're talking about um, healthcare in the home and being more mobile and you know getting getting out there to do people's homes, nursing facilities, and whatever. What are you picturing? Because you also talk about access sure. to the home. So, so we believe, if we look at the United States as an example, in the US, the vast majority of care that's consumed today, an individual moves from a location, home, apartment, et cetera, to go to a physical structure to consume care. Right. And that's necessary in some cases, but not in all cases. Technology, be it digital or otherwise, presents an opportunity to bring care in a more personalized way to the individual. And it also, very importantly, has the ability to extend our care teams. We don't have enough OBGYNs, pediatricians, geriatricians in the United States, and behavioral health professionals. So it's a way to extend the care team, point one. Two, if you think about the home, the opportunity to be invited into someone's home with a care resource, nurse, nurse practitioner, physician to provide targeted care, is enabled, again, through technology because you could have a coordinated care event to that person's primary physician or specialist or otherwise. Today, for example, through our Evernorth organization, we have a nurse within a one hour drive of 90% of all Americans. Not 90% of our customers or patients, within 90% of all Americans. That's a great asset to be able to, again, be invited into someone's home to provide care support and care resources. And finally, Susie, if we think about social determinants of health, That's right. a great way to step into social determinants of health is to be invited into someone's home and deal with the whole person health. Right. So, so again, we yeah. see it not as a transactional event, we see it as a extension of the medical professional, and we see it as a more personalized way to deliver care, mm -hmm. and in many ways, a more affordable way to deliver coordinated care. I'd like to get your take also, when we're talking about different ways to get your care, of what we're hearing from companies like CVS and Walgreens, and again, Walmart was talking about this too, about transforming their neighborhood pharmacies into healthcare clinics, so they're even hiring now physicians. Um, how is this changing access uh, to, to care? And where do you think we're going with all of this? So uh, the United States care delivery co configuration is different than most of the other OECD countries around the world. We're, we're a global health service provider in terms of uh, providing services in 30 countries around the globe, in country, and then again, globally for globally mobile individuals, corporations, IGOs, and NGOs. So through that lens, we come back into the US the U.S. is largely built as a hospital delivery infrastructure Correct. and a specialty delivery right, infrastructure. Right. We're a little lighter in terms of community health. So the point you're raising is markets are starting to develop more community health assets, clinics and the like from that standpoint. But in many geographies, take this municipality here in great, the great city of Boston, th there's a lot of urgent care infrastructure. Mm -hmm. What we have is an underuse of virtual care resources. We have an underutilization of home care. And what's most important is, as this evolution transpires, we need to make sure it stays connected. Mm -hmm. We don't need more fragmented care to be delivered. We need more coordinated care through the medical professional that an individual sees as their gateway to care. 
whether it's a primary care physician or otherwise, mm -hmm. and then see clinics, home health, virtual care is being coordinated right. around it. So it extends the care equation, it brings it more to the community, and it presents the opportunity to integrate it more with technology. So it seems like you're a real fan of that. I mean, what do you think of this provider, payer, integrative business model? And is this something that you can see Cigna doing? I'm picturing your recent acquisition, MD Live, sure. that is, uh, do you see doing more along the lines of what we've just been talking about? From a Cigna standpoint, our, our view is we prefer to partner with the medical professionals versus own. So we've been very clear. We want to partner and enable. In the United States, we have 700 collaborative accountable care relationships. That means we work together. We align incentives more than just paying for volume. We share information. We share care resources, nurses, health coaches, behavioral professionals, and the like. There's four areas where we see the ability to, if you will, own and specialize in. First and foremost, behavioral health. Second, virtual, which I'll come back with. Right. Third is specialty pharmaceuticals, what we talked about in the first question, and then the home. Mm -hmm. We see those as targeted areas where owning or having proprietary resources to coordinate with the physical resource delivery. But we don't seek to own large scale physicians from that standpoint. We do in behavioral, we do it in the other areas I made reference to. Right, right. I mean, do you think that uh, the stuff that uh, Walmart and CVS and uh, Walgreens are doing is the beginning of what we've been hearing for a long time, the consumerization of healthcare, where um, there's a convenience factor and uh, a digital factor, much like what we see in banking and shopping and entertainment. Are we finally moving in that direction? Is this for real? Um, well, well, the consumerization and the digitization, I view, is somewhat separable from that force. I view that force that you made reference to for those two great organizations as a kind of a natural extension of their large geographic footprint. Right? You have organizations that have large geographic infrastructure and footprint that they're looking to innovate around. The consumerization and digitization is how do you capture data, utilize data, and make care more personalized? So if you will, bringing care to the individual before they consider ever going to a, a facility. That, that's the consumerization. That's the digitization. Mm -hmm. How do we turn the center around from a physical infrastructure to a virtual infrastructure and having care be at and my And do you see that happen? I mean, are we really- Unequivocally. Well, and COVID is supercharging that. I, I was COVID, say COVID that, has pushed yeah, probably mm -hmm. a decade mm -hmm. of an adoption curve into 18 months mm -hmm. around the globe, not just in mm -hmm. the United States. Mm -hmm. where many cultures that were even resistant to digitization of care have adopted it more aggressively and seeing positive results both for the individual clinical quality and service quality and medical professionals so long as it's coordinated mm -hmm. so long as the information is shared right. i mean the convenience factor i think is something that we saw in uh, the covid pandemic it was like uh, for the first time people got a taste of hassle-free healthcare, you know, you got your, uh, you didn't pay, go for free, you could get a COVID test for free, you could get your uh, vaccine, you could go to different places besides a hospital and uh, emergency room because they were off limits anyway, all these uh, other places that you can conveniently get great care. And I think that a lot of people have the expectations now that why can't we get that great care in terms of con convenience, not wait for an emergency <laughs> to have to, you know, a once in a lifetime emergency to be able to do something like that. What do you think the impact of that, of the pandemic and this convenience factor is gonna have on healthcare and expectations from the public? Yes, so consumers' expectations were already elevated relative to having service in healthcare more akin to other, other services they consumed in right. their life, right? Yep. In terms of personalized, immediate and convenient. COVID showed that it's possible, and less through the physical infrastructure, more through the virtual infrastructure. If you look at the amount of virtual care consumed during the COVID pandemic, it went up not 10 times, not 15 times, quantum times in terms of the amount of consumption for primary health care, for behavioral health care, and increasingly for coordinated care. So we see that as an accelerant that's gonna to continue to move forward. And so to get punctuate the point, we see that as becoming more of a primary source of interaction where the physical infrastructure is a secondary source of interaction for care that can be delivered virtually so long as it's coordinated longitudinal. Of course, there's some care that has to be delivered physically, right? That will be the case. And therefore, we'll see even further specialization in that 
for the betterment of society. Further specialization yields higher quality, yields better overall affordability and consumer service. So you'll see a, a separation from the services that can be delivered vir virtually to be done so longitudinally in a more effective basis and the services that have to be delivered physically mm -hmm. in a physical proximity, more specialization, higher quality, improved affordability, better personalization. How far off is that scenario? Depends on how you want to look at it. It's present today. The exciting part is it's present today. There's virtual first offerings that are being made in the market that buyers are saying, I want to make the trade off that I want my access point to be virtual first. I want a virtual primary offering. So we're already seeing that transition. You're seeing an accelerant of super specialization um, in the healthcare delivery infrastructure from that standpoint. And in this three to five year horizon, the reformatting is well underway with the capital flows, with the incentive structure and with the consumer adoption process. Well, I mean, that just sounds great. I wanna move on quickly because we're running out of time. I wanna talk to you about wellness. Uh, that's been a big topic uh, here at uh, last night at any rate. I know it's a priority at uh, Sigma. How do you see attention to wellness and well-being, as you say, whole person health uh, evolving? Sure. So if you look at it through, let's take the United States, fully half of Americans access their care through an em employer-sponsored model. From right. that standpoint, employers are seeing today through some work we, um, we worked with the economists on that fully 80% of individuals are feeling the stress, the strain, et cetera, that is coming out from the pandemic. Yet from an employer standpoint, 90% of employers see and believe that if they invest in wellness and productivity, they'll have a healthier business to be able to come out of the pandemic. So there's both more strain and therefore opportunity for interaction, but appreciation for the impact that could be had relative to wellness. And therefore those programs have to be designed in a very consultative, localized basis, employer by employer or physician group by physician group to be able to activate an individual and support but them. How do you um, incentivize people to um, be more healthy, to eat well, to exercise regularly? It doesn't necessarily that the incentive, what do you have to do to incentivize people to do that? So that, that's, there's not a single answer to that, right? All healthcare is personal, all healthcare is local. Mm -hmm. What you have to do is you have to understand if it's an employer, the culture, the health burden, the readiness to change a strategy and personalize it and design it from that standpoint. If you take Medicare Advantage, which is a highly localized individual basis, mm -hmm. you're activating the physician, you're incentivizing an individual, you're not telling an individual, you're supporting them with information. And most importantly, you're trying to find out what's important to an individual and trying to help them in their life and their health journey to live their personal healthiest that life. That is so hard. I mean, we're in a campaign to get people, incentivizing people to get vaccines for the nation's health Correct. and wellness. Correct. And every tool has been used. So you can't, you can't just tell people what to do, right? That's right. You have to come back to their center of gravity, find out what's important to an individual and support an individual in their health journey. And an employer's a way to activate that. Their practicing physicians a way to activate that. Their family unit is a way to activate it. The important part is not trying to force a one size fits all solution and understanding what health means to an individual. There's not a wellness solution for America. There's an individual wellness solution. And for Cigna, having a broad health service company like Evernorth presents the tools to support an individual, an employer, a physician, another health plan that we work with around that. Hard to crack the code on that one, David. I wanna, we just have a few minutes left and I wanna talk to you about leadership because this is really important. You know, all these things we've been talking about require a special kind of a leadership. You've been CEO of Cigna for uh, 12 years, which uh, is a really long time uh, compared to the tenure of most CEOs running Fortune 500 companies. So given your experience, your insights into healthcare, what would you say is the single most important leadership skill that CEOs and healthcare executives need to learn if we're really going to be able to transform American healthcare? So uh, I'm going to cheat and give you more than one, but, but I'm going to ground okay, it because we'll take two. <laughs> I, I think, I think in, in the current environment, what the pandemic has reinforced is there's no playbook for this type of an environment. If the CEO is honest, there's no playbook that says, if then else in an environment like this. So a company and a CEO has to be guided by the mission and the value system of the company. You have to have a great team and you have to be decisive and move quickly. So if you boil it all down in an environment of rapid transformative change, mm -hmm. be guided by that mission and value system, have a great team, 
be prepared to make decisions and move quickly. And one thing that's difficult in corporate America is to recognize that a company can't do everything themselves. Hence, as Cigna, we say one of our strategic imperatives is to be the undisputed partner of choice. So to work with others to drive the change that you're making reference to, mm -hmm. not to try to do it all ourselves from an insular mm -hmm. standpoint. Mm -hmm. And again, the pandemic has reinforced that that, that fr a recipe, if you will, is mission critical. But if I had to put it on one piece, be guided by the mission and values of the company, because that, pr that provides clarity in an environment that is unclear, mm -hmm. in an environment of rapid change, disruption. By definition, there's a lack of clarity. That provides a level of clarity that's mm -hmm. invaluable. How about for you personally, because all during the pandemic, you were writing these very personal op-ed pieces about what you were learning from the pandemic, including leadership lessons. Uh, what's an important lesson that you learned from the pandemic and it's influencing the way that you are running Cigna today compared to pre-pandemic? Sure. So, so we talked a little bit about um, the fact that you can't force a wellness program on an individual, you right. can't, et cetera. So if you step back, the pandemic affected everybody. Me personally, I traveled about 70% of the time. I'm a field-based leader. That went from 70% to zero, like that. Mm -hmm. So then how do you communicate? How do you interact? How do you listen to your colleagues around the globe? You have to adjust to that. And in a way, we've created massive new communication and learning um, tools. Second, stress management, personal well-being, et cetera. When you're on the computer, as right. everybody in this audience has been in Zoom nonstop, you have to figure out a way to be able to manage that. So how do you work a walk-in with a conference call or otherwise in terms of slowing things down when you speed them up from that standpoint? And then lastly, if you merge those two up, it opens the door for some broader partnerships or broader collaboration opportunities if you're a learning being or a learning organization. Mm -hmm. And I find that in the current environment, it's energizing, yeah. even though it's off of a once in a generation pandemic, change and learning is a quite energizing thing to have. Well, that's where all the innovation is going to have to come from. Yes. David, thank you so much for coming by to talk with us. Thank you. It's been a great conversation. Thank I appreciate you. the time today. Thank you.